in this topic we're going to uh, try and introduce some terminology about malicious software, malware, uh, things like what is a virus, what is a worm, and, and some other types of malicious software. We will not go into much detail about each. It will be mainly about being aware of some of the different types of malicious software, but we will not have enough time to go into how each different type works. So mainly the, the thing that I'd like you to pick up from this topic is be aware of some of the terms, the differences between different types of malicious software and uh, some of the classifications. We may see in later topics uh, a few specific cases in, in more detail, different types of attacks. So malicious software is software that does bad things and we're looking from the perspective of okay, some, some attacker that wants to compromise some computer system. One way is to get that computer system to execute some software that does something unexpected. And you know or you hear of a virus, viruses, and that's one form of malicious software. So we'll talk about and try and explain what we mean by a virus. So some general introduction and then we'll try and classify, talk about, well, malicious software. If we get malicious software executing on one computer, then it can do bad things for that one computer but most attackers would like to not just compromise one computer but to spread that malicious software through other computers. So somehow it needs to propagate to other computers. So we'll look at the different propagation techniques. And malicious software, what does it do when it executes on a computer? What can it do bad? So the payloads best indicate uh, what that software does. And then briefly we'll look at the countermeasures, things that we can try to do to prevent the malicious software from causing harm. <coughs> so what do we mean by malicious software, or in short, malware? One definition, a program that is inserted into the system, so a software program, usually covertly, that is it's trying to be hidden so that others cannot find it and has the intent of compromising the security. So returning to our first lecture, the three main parts are confidentiality, integrity and availability of the victim's data, applications and other resources. Or otherwise annoying or disrupting the victim. So that's a, a, a broad definition of malware or malicious software. So a software that gets executed usually tries to be stay hidden so that it can run and continue to run without someone detecting and removing it and to do bad things for example read confidential information modify information modify or uh, compromise the integrity of data and even mod uh, attack the availability of a computer make make a computer system unavailable for the intended purpose And we can broadly classify malicious software by how it propagates and the things that it does, which is called the payload. The, a malicious software, you can think it carries some, uh, some payload that when it executes it does the, uh, the compromising of the computer system. So the propagation is how that malicious software gets to other computers. And we'll talk about a virus, a worm, and, and the difference between a virus and a worm. And the other form of propagation is social engineering. So viruses and worms are about uh, using software and, and network facilities to move the software between computers. Social engineering use is in, about using, uh, taking advantage of the human's weakness to get a human to do something that, that supports the malicious software. So we'll talk about them. And the payload is the actions that it takes. So when the malicious software executes, what does it do bad? It may corrupt the system, that is delete files, uh, 
uh, make it such that some programs cannot run or it cannot uh, modify data, for example. It can, a payload of malicious software may be to enable the computer that it runs on to be accessible for other purposes. And we'll introduce and talk about zombies and bots and botnets. That is to run the malicious software on a computer such that that computer now becomes available for the attacker to do other things. To steal information, so the payload may be to once it executes on a computer is to get some information from that computer and send it back to the attacker. And the payload, the other action of the payload is to try and hide itself, to, to uh, stealthing or, or basically so that countermeasures cannot find that malicious software. And we'll mention just at the end countermeasures, for example, antivirus software. And it's, antivirus software now is not just about pure viruses, but it's about uh, generally trying to stop malicious software of having an effect. And there are different approaches to antivirus or, or stopping malicious software. First, let's look at the propagation techniques. And we'll first generally talk, talk about what is a virus and a very simple virus as an example to demonstrate the concepts. We can say a virus is a piece of software that infects other programs. So I think we have a, we have a normal program on our computer like word.exe. So you can think of Microsoft Word, there's an executable, that's, there's a file on your computer, maybe msword.exe is the name of the file. A virus attaches itself to other programs such that when that program, that normal program, executes, the virus also executes. <laughs> so a virus has a host, and that host is a normal program usually, or maybe some, some uh, file in special cases. And generally we can say that a virus goes through, may potentially go through four different phases. So we have a, a virus attached to a normal program, and that virus may be considered dormant. It's doing nothing. It's just sitting there and does nothing. So when it executes, it, it, uh, it doesn't perform any operations. So it may be dormant for some period of time until it's activated, activated in some way. And there are different ways it may be activated. Uh, maybe some event, some date or time is reached. So when the, the date is the 20th of February 2015 at 9.30 a.m., then the virus changes from dormant to active. So there are different events that may activate a virus. A virus may try and copy itself into other programs or other areas of, of the computer system that it's running on. So you can think if the virus is initially attached to an existing file, for example, word.exe is infected with a virus, when that virus executes, one phase may be to copy itself to other executables on the file system. Copy itself to xl.exe, for example. So the propagation techniques uh, we'll talk about, so copying itself to other programs, such that when the normal user runs those other programs, the virus will be executed again with a means of spreading. The virus may do some bad things, and there may be a trigger to trigger it to start to do bad things, take those malicious uh, actions. So the trigger activates the virus to perform some functions. And the triggers, again, may be some events. I say like logic bombs, but I've, I should have explained that or it's explained later. But uh, think of, for now, logic bomb is just some uh, event that happens, for example, on some time or date or when some files open, but there's some trigger that, uh, or some event that triggers an action. And the action depends upon the implementation of the virus. It may be do different things. It may do harmless things like display a message on your computer or relatively harmless. Say you've been infected by this virus. 
or of course many different malicious things it may do. It may delete files, modify files, encrypt files, and then ask you for money to decrypt those files, which is a common form of uh, malicious ac action that soft software takes nowadays. So there are many different functions that it can perform to cause harm. A virus is executed when, usually when the program that it infects executes, and as a result it's usually, they are usually specific to the operating system or the environments where the, those programs execute. So prop propagating to other operating systems is usually much harder because to execute programs on any operating system uh, is, is much harder to write the software that will do that. So let's look at the, the pseudocode of a very simple virus, or to explain the concept of a virus. It, it doesn't do anything, but it points out those different phases of a virus and how it can attach itself to other programs. Before we go through that pseudocode, let's explain the, the concept with a picture where we can think we have some program, uh, some program P. And let's say it's a, it's a file. Let's say, let's give it an example name. So we have some program, some file on our uh, file system, word.exe, and you can think that program is, uh, is made up of a set of instructions, such that when we execute this program, the instructions inside the file are, are run, are performed. What the virus does, and, or it, we'll use in the simple example, is it attaches itself to that existing program and we'll say it inserts itself, or prepends itself to the existing program. So it inserts itself at the start. So if this file is infected, then the way that we can visualize it is that we have the file, the same file of word.exe, and on top of that, we have the virus. We have a, our normal program, P, and if that program is infected, we can think with respect to the code. The virus code is at the start, followed by the, the code of the normal program, such that when someone opens Microsoft Word, and it's just an example, word.exe, when they try and execute that program, it actually executes the code in the virus first, and then executes the code, the normal code for word.exe, with the aim of when a normal user opens Microsoft Word in this case, the virus code executes, hopefully hiding itself from the normal user, does whatever activities it needs to do, and then the normal code for Word executes and Microsoft Word opens up and the user uses it as, as, as normal. So the slide shows uh, the pseudocode for this part, the virus, assuming it's already infected a particular program. So the program V, that's the virus. The first thing, think of the first operation, go to main. Okay, let's go to main. Here's the main, the main program. And it actually calls a set of subroutines, three subroutines. So the first thing that it does, we've called, there's a subroutine called infect executable. We've, this virus is already attached to an existing program. We've, it's all already infected one program. The aim here is to try and copy the virus and propagate it to other programs and infect other executables. So the subroutine infect executable is called 
If we go up to the definition of that subroutine, it's here. What does it do? Think there's a loop and the first thing it does is it tries to find some random executable file on, the, on your computer. So this is just a, a simple virus where let's say what it does is searches through your computer looking for exe files. That's this step. And it returns a file. And then it checks that file that it finds and it checks say the first line of that file if that first line of the file contains some special string, in this simple example, 1 through to 7, if it contains that special string, then that special string is an indicator that that file is already infected. Because our virus, if we go back to the start, contains that special string. The purpose here is to find a file that is not already infected. If the file is infected, it will start with this special string, so the, the loop is find a random file. If it's already infected, then go back to the loop and try again, find another random file. If it's already infected, find another random file. If we get one that's not infected, that doesn't have this special string, then what we do in the else statement is we attach the virus to that file that we found. So prepend the virus to the file. So this is the propagation step. That is, when someone opens word.exe, the virus executes. The code within the virus executes before word actually opens. And what it's doing at this stage is just finding some files on the file system, checking are they already infected. If not, then attach the virus to that file. So for example, we may find eventually another file. Let's say P2, another program. So it finds this random file eventually, it finds that at the start it doesn't contain the special string of the virus, so it attaches itself to that file. And now it's infected another file. So this is part of the, the, an example of the propagation technique, how to copy itself to other files. Once it's done that, so it prepends itself to the other file, and then this subroutine infect executable finishes. It only, in this case, it only attaches itself to one other file. And infect executable finishes, so we move on to the next piece of the code in our main program. If trigger pulled, so trigger pulled is some other subroutine. If it returns true, then we'll do what's inside the if statement. Trigger pulled, well, would code that to be some conditions that would tell us when we want to do damage, when we want to perform our malicious actions. So it could be some code that says if the date is the 20th of February and the time is 9.30 a.m., then return true. Or if the date is larger than that, date and time is larger than that. Or it could be many of other uh, possible triggers. So it could be if... Um, a particular user is logged in, or if a particular file exists on a file system. So if some event occurs on the computer, then return true. With the idea of this is a way to ensure that the virus only does things under certain conditions. And it may be useful to, uh, depending on what malicious activity it wants to perform, useful to hiding itself. So if some conditions are met, the concept here is if the trigger is pulled, we're ready to do the, the damage, then call the subroutine, subroutine do damage. And again, we don't give the code here, but that can do anything that the, 
the virus implementer wants it to do. For example, delete files, modify files, uh, change some settings on the, on the computer, uh, make use of any software on the computer, depending on what the intention is. So this is just the, the pseudocode to, to show the concepts. Do the damage, for example, delete a set of files, or a, a common thing now is to encrypt files. And some viruses would encrypt all your image and, and document files on your hard disk, search through your hard disk, encrypt all those files with a, a key, and say with a public key, and to decrypt them, you need the private key. And the attacker, the person who distributed the virus, is the only person with the private key, and therefore they're the only one who can decrypt your files. And some attacks today say that once your files are encrypted, the attacker gives you information about you can pay them and they'll decrypt your files for you. So that's an example of some damage that can be done. Once the damage is done, then go to next, which is just really the end of the virus. So the virus code e ends here, and we move on to execute the normal program. So that was this code executing, and then the next thing we do is we, the computer executes the normal program. For example, it starts Microsoft Word. So from the user's perspective, when they double click on the Word icon to start Microsoft Word, it executes this file, which is really executing the virus, potentially doing damage, and then it opens the normal program so that the user isn't aware that that virus was executed. The normal program opens and uh, the user just behaves as, as if nothing has, has happened. But what has happened is that that virus has copied itself to other files and potentially done some damage on the computer. And of course, the propagation to other files means when the user opens Microsoft Excel, the virus will execute again, copying itself to other files. And that's a means of spreading across files. And we'll see later uh, techniques for spreading not across just files on one computer, but moving to other computers, propagating across the network. Any questions so far? This is not a real virus, it's just I illustrating some of the concepts of a virus, of what uh, steps it goes through. We will see a real virus in a moment. How do we detect this? If we want to develop a countermeasure, antivirus, to detect this. <coughs> What could antivirus soft software do to detect this virus? There are a number of ways. What would it do? What, what would the antivirus software do to detect this? There's different ways. Again? Find the virus. What would it look for? You're right. It needs to try and find the virus, so it needs to look. So one way is to look through the files. So, for example, to find the virus, look through Microsoft Word, word.exe, look through the, the code in the files, and try and detect some instructions which are typical of a virus. So that's one way. And we'll see that there are, there are more advanced ways of basically doing that. Try and look through existing files and see if they contain code which is representative of a virus. In this case, in fact, a very simple way to detect, if we knew that Microsoft Word was a particular size, we knew when we installed Word, the file size was a million bytes, now uh, we could check when we check as the antivirus software what's the size of word.exe, we'll see it's larger than a million bytes. We don't expect the executable to change size as we run it, as we do things on our computer. So we install Word, the file size is one million bytes, for example, and then the antivirus later comes back and checks. It checks that word.exe is one million 
and 100,000 bytes. That's an indicator that something has been changed in that executable. So there's a very simple check that antivirus can take is to check the file size and make sure the file size matches the, the previous known file size, the known good file size. Because the virus adds extra code, it basically increases the file size. So one way is just based on file size, but that can be easily overcome by compressing, the virus compressing itself. So on the slides, a compression virus is, is a way to overcome that simple check. A simple virus could be detected by the file length. So antivirus could go and check, okay, we know word.exe is some known size. For example, if we knew when we installed it, it was one million bytes. And then the later the antivirus comes and checks and finds it's one million two hundred thousand bytes, then the antivirus software can compare and see Ah, something's changed. So that's an indicator that this may be infected and then maybe check in more detail. From the virus's perspective, that's easy to defeat by simply compressing the file such that the resulting file ends up the same as the original. So a compression virus can uh, take the original program, attach the, itself, but compress the original program such that when it attaches itself, the resulting file is the same size as the original file. So that, so our original program, let's say, was this size. What the virus does is compresses it, makes it smaller, such that when we attach the virus, the resulting size is the same as the original program. So that the file length doesn't change effectively. So there's a it's not sufficient just to look at file size. You actually, like people suggest, you need to look at the code inside to be able to check and, if, and, and find a virus, which takes some time. Okay? That's why antivirus, one of the, the problems with antivirus is to find the virus takes some time uh, with respect to your computer and uses up resources. So the concept is that you can do things to try and hide the virus. One thing is to make sure the file size remains the same. Okay, so uh, if we want to detect the virus now, and assuming we can't do it by file size, we said we want to look for the virus. What do we look for? What would antivirus look for to try and find the virus now? See the behavior. So, so viruses may have some code in common based on what they do. For example, delete this file or, or do this malicious action. So antivirus could check the, the code inside, say, every executable on your computer and check if that code contains some operations which are common to viruses. If you know the virus in advance, if the antivirus knows the, the code for this virus in advance, then it can simply check and compare. Does this word.exe file contain the code of the known virus? So that's what some, some antivirus software will do. They'll have a database of known viruses, the code for each of them, and they'll go and check. And they'll check on your computer and see does your word.exe file contain this code for all of these known viruses? If so, then we've found a virus. Now that, again, can be resource consuming in that uh, we need to compare against many known viruses. And it also requires the antivirus software to know the virus in advance. So if a new virus comes out, the antivirus software may not know about it yet and cannot check against that. So it wants to be more general and try and check not just against known viruses, but a, a check for common code that a virus may contain.
that's the pseudocode for compression virus. We'll not go through that, but the idea is to shrink it, shrink the program in effect such that when we attach ourselves, the resulting uh, executable is the same as the original. Uh, right, so we'll talk a little bit more about, maybe we'll do the concealment strategies, the, about how a virus will try and avoid detection by antivirus. We saw one approach using try and compress the file so that you cannot detect it based upon file size. There are other approaches and some of the, the types of approaches encrypt the virus. Again, if antivirus software is looking for particular types of code, if the virus is encrypted, then the antivirus software won't be able to see the code and won't be able to compare it against known or uh, expected types of virus code. So one form is the virus actually encrypts itself such that antivirus cannot see what it does. It cannot encrypt its entirety, but the majority of the virus can be encrypted such that uh, it hides most of its operation from antivirus. There may be other ways to try and hide itself a virus. So compression is one thing, but uh, it may try and contain code which appears to be normal. So again, the antivirus cannot detect that. Other common ways are for the virus to change itself. So in our example, when the virus copied itself to xl.exe, in these ca this case, the virus code is identical on both programs. It's the same piece of code. It just copies itself. And therefore, once the antivirus is aware of that code, it can quite easily check all of our executables and see if that code is attached to any of them and find the virus. So one thing the virus can try to do is when it copies itself to the new program is to change the code. And there's two approaches, a polymorphic and a metamorphic virus. A polymorphic virus is that when it tries to copy itself to other programs, will try and change the code, but the code will still do the same thing as the original virus. So it just changes, think, the source code, but the operation is still the same as before. How can we change, have two different programs that do exactly the same thing but have different lines of code, different source code? What can we do in terms of programming? I know you're all expert programmers. What could you do to write two different programs, different source code, but they do exactly the same things? Sorry? Change the language, right. That could be complex for a virus to uh, do the exact same thing in a different language because, so you're correct, but the virus must do this when it copies itself to the other program. Maybe something easier it could do. Change the name of variables. Change the ordering of some operations. So some statements, it doesn't matter what order you execute them in, you'll get the same result at the end. I don't know. Set i equal to 5, set j equal to 10. So two lines of code, if you reverse them, you get different code, but you'll get the same result at the end. So that's the idea that if antivirus is looking for that exact piece of code, then what the virus does is changes the code as it copies itself to other programs so that the antivirus now has to not just look for that exact piece of code, but any variation. And that makes it harder for antivirus. So polymorphic, the virus changes itself, but it still performs the same things. For example, uh, some examples, maybe we have some code in the virus and then we have some statements that we can reorder set some variables. The, 
the, the change, the new version can ch reorder those statements. Different source code, but does the same thing. Or, so this is, say, virus 1, and this is when we copy ourselves to another program, virus 2. Or, virus 1 has some code, J, that's a J. And virus 2 inserts some operations that do nothing. I equals 5. What's an operation that does nothing? What's the name of an operation if you know assembly? Maybe you've seen it. There's a no-op usually. That is most... Uh, Languages, languages support a no-op, or, or if you think of the assembly code, the, the compile code, a, a no-op operation. No, it does nothing. So by inserting this, again, we have different, really, code, but it does the same thing. So the idea is a polymorphic virus, when it copies itself to other programs, it would try and change itself to make it harder for the antivirus to detect. How can antivirus detect that then? It's a constant, constant challenge for the virus trying to hide itself and antivirus trying to find it. What can you do for antivirus now to try and detect this new virus or the new code? Try and check all combinations. As you may imagine, so yes, here's one variation of the virus. So the antivirus looks for, okay, what if we have i equals 5 and j equal to 10, or let's try in the opposite order. But you can imagine if we have many lines of code, there are many combinations that the virus can change to that makes it very difficult for the antivirus to check all of those combinations. Okay, because here's just two combinations, but now we have thousands or hundreds of lines of code, there are many opportunities for the virus to change the ordering or introduce no ops such that the antivirus would need to check all of them. And that's very time consuming for the antivirus to scan through your disk, look for every executable file, and for each executable file, for each potential virus, ch try many different combinations and check whether that code is present. So that makes antivirus very slow. So yes, it can, but it, it reduces the performance of antivirus. Another thing we could try and do is not look at uh, the code itself, but look at what happens when it executes. So some antivirus will actually execute the code, observe what happens, and then if what happens is uh, detected as something bad or something that a virus would do, then you've detected the virus. So the result in both of these viruses, V1 and V2, would be the same. That it will cause the same things to occur at the end. So what antivirus could do is execute them in a safe environment and compare what the end result is with what it expects from this virus. So it knows when it executes V1 that some end result will occur. When it executes V2, if that same result occurs, then we assume it's also a virus. So it don't have to inspect the code, we could actually execute it to see. A way for a virus to get around that is to not just change its code, but also change its behavior. When it copies itself to another file, the new copy, V2, does something different than the original copy, V1. And that's called a metamorphic virus. You can think it actually rewrites itself to do something different. Maybe it uh, deletes different files, maybe it, uh, the code in, has different conditions, different triggers and so on, such that it's much harder for the antivirus to detect because there's no pattern or there's no easy pattern to compare different versions of that virus with. 
But that's much harder for the virus rider to implement. Because get, to getting code to change itself such that it still some, does something reasonable is, is hard. Note that this change must occur, must be implemented, wrong place, inside the virus. That is, when the first version of the virus executes and it copies itself to P2 and changes the code, the virus itself must implement how it changes the code. Okay? Because, so the virus must say, change the source code from this to this. So it must be programmed to change itself. And that's uh, quite complex to do, to, to write code to change itself. Self-changing code, self-modifying code. So just two general approaches that viruses will try and take. The first one, polymorphic, change the code but don't change the behavior. That's generally easier to do with respect to the virus. It's like we reorder the lines of code or introduce no-op uh, uh, statements. That's a polymorphic virus. Easier to do for the virus. And one way to try and detect for antivirus is to look at the output of the virus, not just the source code. A metamorphic virus is harder to detect but harder to write. And what a metamorphic virus does is not only just changes the source code, but changes the source code such that the virus will do something new in the new copy. All about trying to conceal the virus from the antivirus software. Questions about the difference there and polymorphic, especially with metamorphic? Let's look at, before we look at an example, a very simple example, let's look at the target of the virus. So the examples I've given so far is the virus attaches itself to a program like word.exe, such that when we execute that program on our computer, the virus executes. But a virus may attach itself to other things or insert itself in other parts of the computer. So the, the example we use is what we call a file infector. The, the virus infects files. Files that the operating system will execute. So word.exe, there's no need to, there's no purpose of infecting a text file because a text file doesn't get executed, normally at least. So they infect files which would be later executed by the operating system. But there's other approaches. A macro virus can infect files which again are executed but uh, mainly executed by some application or interpreted by some application. So uh, the example and where the name macrovirus comes from, a Word document. Normally we think a Word document just contains uh, some non-executable content. Text and pictures and so on. So a Word document normally is not executed, but in fact most... Uh, so Word documents can include executable code, macros. Macros allow you to program some functionality into your Word document. Who's used macros before? Anyone seen them? A macro in, in terms of Microsoft Office? It allows you to automate things inside Office. For example, you write your Word document, you can create a macro in some programming language that will automate that the, when you open the document, maybe it will format these words in a particular way. It automates those operations. So Word documents and other Office documents support macros such that when you open the document in Word or in other software, it actually executes some code. And so a virus can attach itself to a Word document or a similar document. Because, so it's not just attaching itself to the executable word.exe, it's act attaching itself to uh, my, my homework.doc, a doc file such that when you open that file in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word executes the macro code which contains the virus 
and now the virus executes. And that was for a long time a common way for viruses to be distributed because people would email each other or send each other uh, Word documents or other uh, documents. Someone would open that in Microsoft Word thinking there's no problems with it, but it would contain some macros which included a virus that actually executes. Most Office programs today will disable such macro features by default as a security feature so they're not executed. Another target is the boot sector. That is here, infect executable files that the operating system executes or documents that applications execute. The boot sector, so when you boot your computer, computer there's the BIOS and what happens? That the BIOS reads some part of the hard disk that then loads the operating system. So the op operating system is stored on your hard disk, but to start the operating system, there needs to be some special code to say, let's load this operating system, the boot sector of your hard disk. If the virus is there, if the virus gets infect, uh, can infect the boot se sector of your hard disk, then it means when you start your computer, the virus can infect the operating system and can do things to easily hide from antivirus which has started. So if the virus is in the boot sector, it can effectively control the whole computer because it has control of starting the operating system and it can trigger the operating system to do whatever it likes. This was uh, one of the first ways for distributing viruses in floppy disks. Everyone remembers floppy disks? Or the, at least the smaller versions? What about the bigger ones? Five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Anyone use them? Okay, so the floppy disks that the computers would use, they were sometimes used to boot a computer. So you, you wouldn't have uh, the computer boot from the hard disk. You insert the floppy disk, start the computer, and the, the operating system is loaded from the floppy disk and boots from there. If that floppy disk is infected with a virus, then effectively that infects the entire computer. Not so common today, although some of the more recent attacks have taken advantage of uh, a recent one of not just infecting the boot sector, but infecting the hard disk. So the hard disk that you buy from Seagate or whoever has some code on it to run the hard disk, some firmware. If that is infected, then everything you do with that hard disk can be compromised. So different targets. A multipartite virus is one that can combine those methods, really. Let's look at an example. And I, the examples I don't need you to remember, uh, but just to have a, a, a quick look, to have a look. This is just a, here's your quiz. No, this is just a, an example of a virus, an old one. Take a copy. I'll show it on the screen. There are many copies, don't worry. I think there should be enough. This is an old virus called the Melissa virus. Can you use this virus to attack? my computer. First point is that, no, when we talk about viruses, you, you should, you, sh you may study them, but you should not use them. Okay. Uh, and secondly, no, this one won't work. Okay. I don't run Windows, so you won't attack my computer. You'd need another one. But let's look at it just to show, and we will not understand the, all of it, the code, but just to show uh, maybe the simplicity of this virus. Where is it? OK, thank you. I've got it somewhere. What is it? 
This was uh, maybe a bit hard to see on the screen, but you have the hard copy. This was implemented in Visual Basic. Uh, and this was a virus attached to a Word document, so a macro virus. So what happened, so there was a normal Word document that was distributed and attached with that Word document was some macros. And macros are used to automate things in Word and other Office applications to, to automate. Uh, you run, run some code that automates some actions. And this is the code which was attached to the Word document, the macro uh, and we'll have a look at some of the things that it does. We don't have to understand everything, and I don't. Um, but just to so when the document is opened, so when the Word document is opened in Word, then this code gets executed. That was the idea. And some of the things that it does, uh, here it's doing some check about some settings in Microsoft Word the security level and checking if what the current security level is so in word there are some security levels which allow the user to disable the execution of macros so it's doing some checking and setting the security level to a particular value depending upon the current level such that in the future so the idea is to turn off the security features in word so the next time someone opens an infected document the security features will not be enabled. That's the idea of this. Uh, let's find... This virus used Microsoft Outlook. What's Microsoft Outlook? Anyone know? Email client. Okay. Uh, mainly used in, in, so in businesses when people have not just webmail but email clients. Microsoft Outlook is a widely used program for, for email. And so in, in large companies, many people would have Microsoft Outlook installed as well as Office and, and other Microsoft applications. So this took advantage of Microsoft Outlook to actually distribute by email. So it does some checking to make sure that Microsoft Outlook is, is, is available. And Let's see what it does, the easy parts to understand. What it does with Microsoft Outlook is it gets, it reads the user's address book. So in an email client you have a, your address book, your contacts. So what it does is it reads the address book and For each entry in the address book, it goes through and let's see this code. For each entry in the address book, it goes through and creates an email. The subject of that email is here, important message from, and the, the subject of the email contains the actual username of the person who, whose computer is infected. So if it was my computer infected, it would say, important message from Steve in the subject of the email. And it creates the body of the email. Here is that document you asked for, don't show anyone else. It attach, attaches this Word document to that email and then it sends the email. So in this case the propagation is via email. So what it did is that it, and it did it for 50 different addresses, so this x greater than 50 here is the, the limit, it will only do it for 50 users, so it looks in my address book, for the first 50 people in my address book it creates an email and sends them an email. And those 50 people will get an email from me saying important message from Steve, here is that document you asked for and then the attachment and the attachment is the infected Word document which is executing this code. So those 50 people would receive the Word document and if they open the Word document then the virus will run on their computers as well. So this is the propagation technique in this case. So that's propagation, what else does it do? Uh, 
we go down and see some of the activities. I think towards the end it becomes the main thing. It actually tries to also infect the, the Word template file. In Word you have templates such that when you create a new document there's some basic template format. And the, the template file was usually called normal dot dot, a template file, and it tried to infect that as well. But we get down to the end and it says what this virus does. Here's a trigger or a logic bomb. If the day, if the current day equals the current minute, then display some message on the screen. So this is a harmless message and it's triggered at a particular date and time. So if the current day is the 20th and the current minute is minute 20 in the hour, then this would be true and it simply displays some message on the screen saying so that the user would see that they get this strange message and maybe detect that this virus is present. So this doesn't do anything dangerous like deleting files, it just displays a message. What's the problem with this virus in terms of what damage can it perform? can it cause? So it just displays a message, not so much of a problem. What's the problem on a computer system or a computer network that it uh, can cause? What does it do that can cause us damage? It sends an email to 50 of my contacts, okay, all right? not a big problem yet. So it sends to 50 of my contacts. Those 50 people get it. Let's say 10 of them open the email and click on the attached document. So they are infected and they send 50 emails to their contacts. So there's another 500 emails. 10 of the people who receive mine open and send to 50, so another 500 emails. And those 500 people to receive, say some of them will open and then send another, whatever, 20,000 emails. And within a short period of time, there are now millions, if not billions, of emails being sent due to this virus across the world. And the main problem with this virus, the, the, the result was not that it deleted files or anything, it was that it used up network resources. And many email servers started to crash because there were so many emails being sent. And when email servers crash, no one can access their email and that may damage business operations. So without understanding all of the code, I think you can realise that, what, it's 104 lines. So it's not long, this virus is just 104 lines of Visual Basic code. It doesn't do much, but this is again information you don't have to remember but this was in 1999 that it was released the way that it was first distributed that it was the original document was sent to some news group and the people who opened that were infected with the virus it was estimated at the time it caused 1 billion US dollars of damage the damage was in terms of having the, the email servers not working because they were overloaded with emails and as a result the, they had to spend time, each company had to spend time to fix their, their computer systems and remove the virus. So the, the damage was thought in terms of uh, unavailability of the computer system. The guy who released it was arrested and, and spent about two years in prison because of that, so that 104 lines of code. And it required some conditions, so it required Microsoft Outlook to be running and that uh, it was widely distributed because it sent email to 50 people, so that spreads very quickly. 50 people send to 50 other people and so on, and it doesn't take long to be to, to millions of people. And at that time, in 1999, most people when they received a Word document would just open it up and have a look, and that executed the virus. So that's one simple example. Any questions so far? Of course, you're not going to write a virus. 
but uh, one thing that you may be tasked with in the future is to say set up antivirus and be aware that for a, for a company that you work for that how to stop viruses how to educate your users and, and to set up software techniques to stop viruses so you need to be aware of them We may present a couple of other examples later. Let's talk about worms. And there's similarities between a virus and a worm, and sometimes some overlap, so it's hard to tell the difference. But we often think a virus attaches itself to other software or other documents to be executed. A worm, think, is a standalone program. So think of its own executable that also tries to spread and to do damage on other computers. So a worm usually think of it as, as some program that once it's executing will try and seek out other computers to spread to and then infect those other computers and, and continue. And once that worm can execute on other computers, then it can do other things like damage on those computers or, or set up for other attacks on those computers. And to spread, worms usually need to take, take advantage of some, some bugs or vulnerabilities in, in networking software. We'll show an example which took advantage of the bug in web servers such that someone could send a, web, a request to a web server which would require that web or result in that web server executing some malicious code and then spreading to other websites. So worms usually take advantage of spreading via network connections, network software. They may be spread via shared media. So you plug in your USB into someone's computer and a worm is copied onto your USB. So when you plug your USB into another computer, it can be copied from the USB to that new computer. So that's some form of manual transmission. And they may be spread in macros, in, in documents, in the similar one that we saw with the Melissa virus. What a worm will try and do is try and replicate, make copies of itself and spread to other computers. And it usually carries some payload, which can maybe be doing some uh, damage in terms of deleting files or other things. I think we'll go direct to an example, and I think you don't have a, just to give a quick example of a worm. Uh, again, these are some old examples from some of my old lecture notes, so I haven't provided them to you, but just uh, to make you aware of some of the effects. The code red worm back in 2001, what it did was it took advantage of bugs in the Microsoft web server. The Microsoft web server is called IIS, or it was at the time. Uh, so what it did, so many people run this web server to host their websites. What it did is it sent a special HTTP GET request. Like a browser normally sends a GET request to a server, to initiate it sends a special request to the server where that a bug in that server allowed the code in the request to be stored on the server. Normally a server, when it gets, receives a request for a web page, just grabs the web page and returns it to the user. But sometimes a server will execute some code in, or do some operations based upon the, the request. And there was a bug in the server that meant that if you coded the request in a particular way, that the server would store what's in the request, in memory, which would later be executed. So the worm was attached to the GET request, sent to a web server, and if the web server had that bug, it would store it in memory, and that worm would be executing in that web server. It was stored in RAM, so a, a reboot of the server deleted the worm, but most web servers are not rebooted, because they just keep running. And what it did, once it infected a particular web server, is that it went through different periods. So for the first 19 days of the month, it would try to infect other web servers. So it would send random or send requests containing itself to other websites randomly with the hope of 
spreading to those other websites, infecting them. Then for eight days of the month, it would then send many messages for all those web servers which were infected, send many messages to a particular target, in this case the White House website. So send many mes messages to that website with the aim of overloading that website, which is a denial of service attack. And then it was dormant, for, and then it repeated. It infected about 200,000 servers in the first five hours that it was available. So that's a very fast spread rate in that as soon as it infects one web server, that web server now then starts to seek out other web servers. And it took five hours to get many infected. And again, the main cost of it was not doing things like deleting files, it was using up network resources. The web servers become overloaded and many packets being sent, so the network slowed down and it affected the, the normal users. So a denial of service attack was the main result. And there were modifications of that to try and uh, do some other things as well. So that's an example of a worm which spread via infecting web servers. There are other ways that they can spread. Some of them are listed there. So uh, via email, they can spread file sharing uh, via uh, USB drives and so on, or, or via file sharing applications, for example. Uh, usually network software. Software that allows you to send packets across the network, if they can take advantage of that software, that they can copy the worm from one computer to another. And I think that's all we'll say about worms at this stage. The other aspect of spreading, so we're about propagating. Viruses propagate by attach attaching themselves to other executables or to, to, to documents, a macrovirus. Worms spread by copying the actual program across a network. The other approach is to trick users to, to assist the attacker in compromising the system, so social engineering. And a, a common example is spam email. Send many emails to people unsolicited bulk email, so many emails, bulk email, unsolicited, you didn't ask for it, or it's not from someone who would normally send you an email, with the aim of tricking that user to execute some uh, compromised software. So this takes advantage of tricking the users to do something they shouldn't do. Maybe open a link that leads them to some other malicious software or to download an attachment, like a, an attachment that contains a virus. And I think you may have seen, or of course you may unfortunately see many spam emails, and you may see some of them contain links in them, and many of those links would take you to websites which when you visit the website, under certain conditions, that would then infect your computer. That is, visiting the website downloads a file to your computer which is infected and now that's a one way of spreading uh, uh, malicious software. We'll talk about I think towards the end uh, phishing attacks. What's phishing? Friends. Phishing. You've heard of phishing. What's the definition? Pretend that someone sends an email. Right, searching for, yeah, so a social engineering attack, searching for, uh, yeah, pretending to, to uh, be someone with the aim of getting information from that person. So sending them an email and with the hope that they'll do something, like click on a link. Or, or respond in a particular way to get some uh, um, information from them that you can use then to compromise a system. Trojan horses uh, refers to software which is normally useful but can also do harmful things. So you go to a free download website where you can download lots of software and you download your favourite software 
and it does the normal things, the things that you need it to do. But included in that software is also some code that does malicious things. So that's an example of a Trojan horse. That is, uh, the software is the normal software plus the malicious software. Let's just quickly look at what the malicious software may do, the payloads, the things it, it can contain. the payload can be performing system corruption, so try and cause, cause problems on your computer system. Data destruction, so delete data, delete files. Overwrite data is usually better than deleting data. If you delete a file, then it, you can have checks to check quite easily, Do, has that file been deleted? And therefore try and detect things go wrong. If you overwrite a file, let's say you have a file of one megabyte, a photo, and a um, virus overwrites that with one megabyte of zeros, then of course you've lost your photo and that your system may not be aware that it's been lost because you still have a when one megabyte file there. The only way you're aware is when you try and open that photo and you see it, it no longer uh, is viewable. So overwriting can have different effects from just deleting. And ransomware is available, which I mentioned before, where the virus or malicious software encrypts data, usually using a, uh, a public key. And if something is encrypted with a public key, the only way it can be decrypted is with a private key. And who has the private key? The attacker does. So what they do is they encrypt your files and then you get a message saying your files are encrypted. If you want to see them again, if you want to get access to your files again, send me some money and I'll send you the key to decrypt. And if you and don't, don't send the money, then your files stay encrypted, so effectively lost. Some system corruption, not just on data, but on real-world damage, so it can damage hardware. Uh, we will not get it today, but we'll, I'll point you next week to Stuxnet, uh, a very advanced piece of malicious software, which one uh, aim was to cause some power plants and some uh, industrial control systems to fail. That is, we have computers controlling different things in factories or in... in uh, um, different machinery and if that malicious software can get the machinery to operate outside of its specs to do things that it shouldn't do then that m machinery may fail. So Stuxnet one uh, thought intention of that was to cause some machinery that works in nuclear power plants to fail such that those uh, uh, resources could not be used. And logic bombs we mentioned before is when some certain conditions are met, it uh, takes some action like data destruction or real world damage. The conditions may be the presence of files, some date or time, or some particular software or user is being software is being run or user is present. We'll come back to zombies and bots next week. But quickly, information theft, try and steal information. So get some malicious software on the computer, for example, that captures all the keystrokes, all the, the keys you press on your keyboard. Because if the software can record every key you press, then usually they'll include your password, your uh, secret information that you type in. So if it captures all the keys you press, then it can go through and look through that log of all the keys you pressed and try and look for uh, sequences that may mean your password. So key loggers can, can do that with the aim of stealing people's passwords. And spyware refers to software that will try and monitor the activity on the computer system. Monitor the history, the, the browsing activity, with the aim again of learning something about what the user is doing to, to uh, support some other attack redirect you to other fake websites. 
maybe because the, the attacker owns that fake website and gets money for every time someone visits it through advertising. Uh, and maybe even changing data between your browser and, and other websites for performing some malicious actions. Was there one more? Phishing. So, pretend to be someone that you would normally trust. For example, sending you an email and pretending to appear as if it's from someone that you would trust so that you would uh, follow the instructions in that email. For example, visit the link or download and, and open the attachment. And then, say, visiting that link to a website would cause you to do, uh, download some other malicious software. It could be linking to a fake website for a bank. So please go to your bank and change your username and password. So you click on the link, go to the website, you enter in your u new username and password. That website was a fake bank website run by the attacker and now the attacker knows your username and password for your real bank account. Spear phishing is a more targeted uh, case of phishing where the attacker usually knows something about the, the recipient, the person they're targeting. So phishing on its own is usually done in bulk. That is, an attacker sends messages to many people with the hope of some of them will be tricked into following those links and they'll get some information from them. Spear phishing is about the attacker targeting, say, one person. They know something. Let's say you want to target me. You know something about me, therefore you can write an email which is something that I would believe and it's much higher chance that you can get me to follow the link, open the attachment and, and you be successful as the attacker. So spear phishing is about a targeted phishing attack. And there's many other types of malicious software. Some of them are listed here, you may uh, go and read about them, we won't cover them. Uh, but many types of malicious software, you should be aware of the basic ones we've mentioned. Next week we'll just uh, go over the ones we skipped, zombies and botnets. So I'll give you a couple more examples, I mentioned Stuxnet and one or two others. We'll talk about the countermeasures, some different approaches for stopping malicious software, and that will finish this topic. <coughs>